wasn't a low moment, but that, that suggests a singular. <laughs> there was fucking millions <laughs> of low moments. So, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to, to admit this, there was many, many, many weeks where I would get to the end of the week and I would pick up the phone to my mum and I would be either in tears or, or near to be in tears. And it was just, it was just a relentless... I mean, I moved into a space where we had to be sourcing food, producing food to a time limit, delivering it to a certain spot at a certain temperature, food and safety regulations. Then there was building out a recipe, building a website, sales and marketing. We have 60, 60 people now. But, it, but the, I think what really hit me is that it, it wasn't something I could send off into the world digitally, this kind of product, and then say, well, people are complaining, but the email list will build up, and oh, the emails will build up, and I'll deal with it at the weekend. Everything had to be dealt with now. And so it was relentless. It was, it was, it was horrible, and there was definitely a lot of moment, low moments. Um, I mean, there's the, the, the screensaver I have on my phone. The, actually, the screensaver I have on my phone, yeah. I should show this to the camera. That was probably the best part of six years ago. So what that shows, I think it's four pounds fifty. The story behind that is, I used to pay my rent. I, I lived in a flat owned by a buddy, and yeah. we used to meet um, every every month. I used to give him cash and yeah. rent, and met him, paid the cash late because I'd been putting off a meeting, so I didn't have the money. And we were walking down Portobello Road, and I went into Subway to buy to buy a diet coke and. My card declines. Yep. Put in the next card. Fine. Put in the next card. And this was in the moment where I was like mixing personal and business money left, right, and centre. Yeah. Like accountant's best friend. Um, and I thought that's a bit worrying. That's a bit worrying that I can't afford a one pound nineteen bottle of Diet Coke. So went to the bank. Two cards, nothing. Credit card, nothing. Went to another bank, nothing, nothing. And I just thought, fuck, like. This is, this is it. This is actually the moment in time where I have to admit that there's, that there's no way I can turn this around. Um, went home and, I mean, that photo, I genuinely, looked, I genuinely thought, well, how much money do I have? And this was a ridiculous thing. I mean, the, the, yeah, next, yeah. Day, the next day, I owed about £1,600 or something like that to staff, to suppliers. And I was like, well, how much money do I have? So I collected everything, put it on the table in front of me, and it was four pounds fifty. And I, I took and and I didn't take the photo there, I took the photo the following weekend. So that was a Thursday, I remember really distinctly. And I just I had this moment where I just kept on saying, Well, well this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. And I remember staring at the floor and I just had this moment where I don't know exactly what the words that went through my mind, but the feeling when I look back was like I'm I'm, I'm gonna, it's almost like I want to make the decision when, when it's the end. And if I'm in control of that decision, then I, I will basically refuse to give up. Something will have to physically force this thing to stop. I will not be the person who says, okay, it's over. Like that's, that's not in me. And so I made the decision that I was going to bring in more the next day in terms of money than I probably brought in in the previous two weeks. Uh, in order to save the business. So I made phone call after phone call after phone call. I set up three meetings the next day. And I mean, this is, this is fucking hustling. I so I set up the next, the set up meetings the next day. The first meeting I went into, I met the woman in a hairdresser's on Queensway. Wow. And there and then she bought the biggest package which we'd ever sold. Wow. And she transferred the money. Like I was kind of like, I don't really want to leave just in case you're like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. So I kind of like sat as she was having a, like her, her hair done, done, yeah. done, literally, as we're sat now, as she transferred £1,500, and I just thought, I've only got to get £100 more to save the business. And I think that day I brought in about £2,500. And that was like from the lowest moment to, to elation. I, I knew within myself I had the ability, like people would buy this thing that I'd created, but within me, I had the energy and I had the ability to convince people that this thing was worth yeah. buying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. I'm a proud Cornishman. Yeah. And we'll come back to it in a bit, but that's that's where my kind of like entrepreneurial aspirations will go in, sure. in down the line. Um, grew up in Cornwall, loved you know, loved my rugby, good friend group, went to school just over in Devon at a grammar school, 
And like absolutely everyone in my year went to university, you know, I, I really didn't kind of question that that was the path to take. York for three years um, and had a great conversation with a family friend who basically put it this way, probably going to be working for 50 years. Why not have another year at university and work for 49 place. years? I just, I just, I saw a lot of sense in that. So um, decided to extend the academia and put off the work for another year, went to Oxford, um, which was exactly like you said, it was enriching, met with people like just so vastly superior intellectually that to anyone I'd ever met and also myself, like no false modesty there, just yeah. incredible people, um, inspiring on an academic level, um, but I knew that that wasn't for me, I wasn't going to write books, I wasn't going to teach, um, and I thought, what can I do? I wanted to kind of make sure I earned some good money, mm -hmm. and I also thought that the key skill that I had was to be able to read a bunch of information, and to summarise it Makes sense. in a couple of pages. Very Very yeah, now that is a core, core yeah. skill. And so I, I kind of looked around and I thought, well, being a lawyer was the thing that jumped out. Um, and, you know, it also makes mum proud. You know, it's yeah. always going to be a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of closed that door, so it was a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I went down to Guildford yeah. um, and studied uh, law school there for two years. Um, in the process, picked up a training contract, which is where you apply for, you know, you apply for big firms and you read the glossy brochures and you go in and you give them the answers they want, mm -hmm. not really the answers that's really going on in your head, you know, like, it, I mean, yeah, you know, they say what's your weakness, you say, I'm a perfectionist yeah. and that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, but I'm, I'm working on it, don't worry, I'm working on it. Um, they say, and I'm sure they've just sat there as yeah. like a hundred kids a day came Brilliant. in and said the same so thing. <laughs> um, but no, and so yeah, I, I ended up, I landed in London in my first day of work would be in March or April 2007. Four years as a lawyer, I, I loved it. Mm. And I think, um, I think there's a few reasons I loved it. It was challenging. Mm -hmm. It was, it kind of had that intellectual element to it. Got to work in Moscow for six months. Oh, okay. Probably the kind of like wildest six wow. months of my life. Really, really fun. Okay. Um, it was also during the economic, you know, when everything went down the yeah, yeah. There was nothing to do. There was no work. So I was over in Moscow, got wow. rid of my flat in London. Wow. 25% tax free uplift in my pay. Wow. And no work to do. Incredible. Kid in the <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So, um, but I, I probably realised after, may, I can't remember precisely, maybe maybe towards the end of two years, I had the job lined up. So you do two years training and then you qualify. Same with the same firm. But there was this, there was this kind of nagging, a few push, what I call now, looking back, push factors. Um, I didn't hate the firm, no bridges burned, love people, still got some good friends there. Um, and first, my first clients came from there as well, from oh, my first business, so you know, it's, it, it, it's done its job there. Um, but there was just something, I didn't want to be a partner anymore, and I'm quite a competitive person. Um, I, I just started to feel, th these words came into my, in, into my mind. So we were doing cool stuff, I worked in a, in a department called Projects and Infrastructure Finance. So it wasn't just pushing numbers around, it was building stuff like St. Pancras, like military bases, power stations, wow. roads, railways, it's, so it's quite cool. But I kept on, I kept on, first of all, to, well, on the tube, on the work, going to work every way, I, I used to sit there on the tube. I had this like completely irrational feeling, which was, I just want this journey to continue. Even though it's not a nice journey, I don't want to get to work. I just, I, I, wow. I, there's not enough there for me wow. to be like stimulated, to feel passionate, to feel like I'm contributing. And that word contributing leads me on to the second thing that I really felt, which is, and this, this, is, this is quite like an emotional thing, I didn't want to look back on my time working and basically say, I helped a bunch of grey-haired guys that I've never met improve their share price by one or two percent. Wow. And I, I felt that's what I was doing. Big work, very, very small cog. Where was the impact? Like that, for me, that, that was it. And that's really what that... that there was push factors there, so I was kind of starting to become a little bit, a little bit disillusioned, and also just like I didn't want to move up the chain. Um, as a firm, we went through a few, few firms, uh, as kind of rounds of redundancy, and the firm were incredible. Like some firms just cut, they moved us down to four days. They tried doing like flexible working hours, all this kind of stuff. And I think we went through a couple of rounds, and in, in the third round, I was made redundant. I knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. When I say I knew it was coming, I had a holiday booked to the Miami Music Festival the next day. So redundant on a Friday, wow. waking up, actually waking up 
at spring break in Panama Beach Man, on Saturday. Yeah, that, so that, that, really that was how um, that's how committed to the redundancy process I was. I was out of it. Um, I had a couple of weeks there, then my my music festival extended to stay longer, work got a bit worried, I came back, I said, look, we've had the conversation, everything's fine, sign the papers and that and it was done. Um, and then I had a little bit of a period where um, I think I was just it wasn't like I needed a break. You know, I now I now realise when someone says they need a work from break, uh, a break from work, it's kind of like it's decompression, it's mm. headspace, sort of stuff. I just I think I needed to kind of like, what am I actually going to do with my life? Mm. Um, and there was my initial idea was actually for a male only lifestyle business, and the idea and and there was going to be seven limbs. Mm-hmm. Love life, fashion, interior design, nutrition, mm-hmm. exercise, travel, finance. Which was, I think I was think that was a seven. Yeah. Um, and I woke up and I realised I knew nothing about anything of yeah. those of those seven things. I you know I had uh, some nice letters after my mm-hmm. name and qualifications, but none of them related to any one of those limbs. Um, and I just asked myself like, what am, what am I most passionate mm-hmm. about? And it was food. Mm-hmm. Grew up in a Cornish pub, um, and, and food has always been just a thing to enjoy. But we've always holidayed in Spain, we, and my sister, mm. I've got a sister lives in Spain, and we do a lot of things wrong with food in this country, and one mm. of the things is the level of respect we give to it. You go to the continent, and I've just got these lovely memories of, of you know, a paella being prepared for two hours and enjoyed for three hours. You sit around, you talk, there's a dynamic, and food, mm. food has this kind of social dynamic and this ability to kind of bring people together, and I think we, you know, with our... Grabbing a grabbing a burrito on the go kind sure. of kind of yeah. culture, um, so that was with me. I've always loved my sports, so the fitness was with me. But the one thing that four years as a lawyer gave me, other than the the, the knowledge that I didn't want to be a lawyer, <laughs> was frustration with the lifestyle in London. Um, I felt I was eating the way London wanted me to eat, interesting, rather than the way I wanted to eat. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of passion combined with that frustration and said, and said well, I, I love food, I love fitness. And I've always, I've always just felt that this, I, 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 London's the best city in the world. Full stop, yeah. like end of, end of conversation. Um, and yet I couldn't, there wasn't a company who would personalise my food and deliver it to my door. Mm. And it was just one of those amazing entrepreneurial moments. Like proper, like textbook, mm. I want something, look out into the world, confused and baffled mm. that something didn't exist, so I'll do it myself. Mm. And and that's the moment the Fresh Fitness Food was born. Oh fantastic. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. What a story. So that's my quick that's my quick and dirty. But that, that's very myself. interesting yeah. because you are you have a moment of clarity there. Mm. Um you went through a process of self doubt, uh, you thought you would uh, you could do something and then you sort of spoke to yourself. There's a lot of reflection going on there. Yeah. How, how did you manage to do that? How did you manage to come up Oh, Over that self doubt is is that because you you trained in sports? Uh, is that because you had a little stint being a lawyer? What 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 helps you kind of battle with yourself and then come to a moment of clarity? Very interesting. I think I think a couple of things. That there's there's probably a conversation that that happened, and this always makes the the, the hair on my on my on my neck go go back. But there's a, there was a couple of things. It was a little bit of self doubt. I've always been a very confident person. Um, at the same time, I've always been, it doesn't matter how low some of the moments have been, there's always been this voice, even when I've been saying the words, you know, I'm fucked here. Mm-hmm. I know there's this other voice saying like, yeah, don't worry. I mean, we know you're saying that, but like that's that's for the world. You know, we know what's going on inside. But there, there was this very, very impactful conversation. And and I, I mean, I, I owe an awful lot to this lady. She's an incredible lady. She's a friend of my auntie's. And met with her a couple of times. Um, she's what do I call her? She's uh, an executive coach, she's a performance coach. Comes very much from the corporate world, but she just she just cuts to the heart of of, of being human. Um, and we had a few conversations. She ran me through a few processes, but there was one one question um, or one scenario that she made me go through, which I I, I will I, I, I push on the people you know, in kind of mm. consultancy space, clients to do it. She basically said, imagine yourself your 80th birthday. And, sorry, no, that's a lie. Ima- Im- 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 yeah, no, sorry. Imagine yourself your 80th birthday and you, you can have five people there, regardless of whether they're 
still here, regardless of whether realistically they mm -hmm. would still be here. Um, and you overhear a conversation that they're having. Mm -hmm. And someone asks a question, what are you most proud of about Jared? What do you remember most about Jared? Looking back on Jared's life, what, what, what do you, you know, have the fondest memories of? And you know, I thought, my mum there, my sister there, you know, my partner there, my best mates. Uh, and, and just to run through what the people that mean the most to you would say about your life, I was like, and it's making the head, it's like yeah. my, my neck's going out. Like, I'm big on regret. Mm. You know, there's many, many things you can you can change. One of the things is the past. You, you, you simply can't change. Yeah. So I hate the concept of waking up when I'm, when I'm 40, 50, 60, certainly 80, 90, and unable to change the past. And really, un, at that stage, unable to go in a new direction um, and be asked me what if. And that was huge. So I, I felt at that moment that although there was all these push factors moving me away from the legal space, moving me away from being a lawyer, and the stability and the good mm. waves that, that brings, um, I suddenly realised in, in that moment that there was these huge pull factors as well. Pull factors that I'd, I'd never identified, I'd never tapped into, I'd never had a conversation with that part of myself. Those pull factors were building something. They were about legacy. They were about adding value, changing people's lives. I realised at that moment as well, my mum and dad had built up a, um, a pub business from, from absolute nothing to dad running the, the, the bar and mum running food. He never pulled a pint, she never cooked a cottage pie, and yet they had people going 100 miles out of their way on the journey to come and stop for the food. And regulars who basically saw it as this borderline lifeline, it was the heartbeat of this lovely kind of community in Cornwall. And I also realised in my moment what they'd achieved. They, they, it wasn't about money going through the till. It was about the people whose lives they were changing. It was about the value they were adding. Um, and it was about the legacy they left behind. You know, I know that they would walk down that down, you know, to that village now and be recognised and be thanked. And that's kind of where I, I, I realised in those conversations with that lady, reflecting back on the life I had yet to lead, it was that moment where I realised I had to leave something, I had to build something. You know, I wanted to make a difference. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, it kind of alludes to, I, I sometimes sort of feel that, and of course you are further ahead in the entrepreneurial journey, um, but <clears throat> I always feel very empty many a times, and mm. I used to feel quite um, um, uncomfortable about it. Yeah. Because I, even when you are in the moment, the heat of the moment, you're on a big set and you're producing this beautiful commercial, thousands of pounds being spent on that hour, and, and suddenly you feel empty. I don't know if you feel that moment, but then... I, I started to be comfortable with it, mm. and as you're saying, because I started to tell myself it's part of the journey, it's yeah. part of your legacy, it's part of adding value, and sometimes it's not about you, it's you are defined by these five amazing people oh, who, 100%. You know, going to talk about you and what you're leaving behind, and that gave me a sense of purpose and a sense mm. of duty to carry on to be myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's very interesting, because this kind of brings me to the kind of big question of entrepreneurship and purpose of life because I think there's a lot of talk out there at the moment with big names who who push a lot of numbers you know uh, they talk about you, know, you need to give yourself a number goal you need to of course I guess these are exercises and yeah. you, you need those kind of tangible exercises as, as milestones but what defines your entrepreneurial uh, purpose of life yeah interesting I, I, th I think it's it's part of the human disposition to, to focus on numbers. Mm -hmm. It gives us a target. You know, we, yeah. I mean, you know, you're five years old and being patted on the back for getting a, a 10 out of 10, uh, not, not one out of 10. So yeah. I think that's, that's ingrained mm -hmm. um, and that sticks with you. And I think, those, I think if, if, that's, if, that's, if you need to focus on the numbers to tap into the more important goals, like as almost a stepping mm -hmm. stone, fantastic. So, you know, no one says, like, my goal in life is to get up get, get out of bed at six o'clock. Um, my goal as a salesperson in life is to set this to send 100 emails. Yeah. Well, no, it's not. Yeah. Your goal is to wake up at a time where you can achieve what you want to do with the mm -hmm. mindset that you need. Your goal as a salesperson is, you know, I guess one level could be revenue, mm -hmm. but another level could be I want to get my product or service mm -hmm. to X people. In order to do that, I have to make up mm -hmm. phone calls. So I think the numbers are, I think you realise... They're important, mm -hmm. they add structure. But for me, the goals are always quality. The goals, you know, the goals in fresh fitness food are making people happier, mm -hmm. healthier, letting them live longer lives, mm -hmm. and adding a level of convenience and reassurance in a really confusing world 
where basically there's a lot of shit people trying to earn easy, easy money. You know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah. And as soon as there's confusion, whether it's at a high level in the stock yeah. market, whether it's with food, yeah. nutrition, whatever, training, um, there's money to be made. This, this is very interesting because you touched upon two things which are close to me. You touched upon values and ethics of a business mm -hmm. uh, in a crowded, noisy marketplace, and you touched upon salesmanship. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see sales being dirty at all. I actually absolutely embrace it and mm. love it because I'm passionate about what I yeah, do. Same. I always have. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone said um, I started uh, running an app business and I knew nothing about coding and I started running it. So, you know, a sales agency knew nothing about it. Um, but then I was scared to start a creative business um, because I thought nobody would buy me and I'll be a fraud and I'll be, you know, I'm not fucking anybody mm. in the game. And then suddenly I realized, actually, I'm passionate about selling ideas, even get the right people who can execute it. Yeah. That's great. They will buy into it. Uh, and that's what shift happened. But tell me more about sort of fresh fitness food yeah. as the ethos of the business. Sure. And then how much your salesmanship and your passion to convey that message helped it to grow and where it is at the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's worth going back and... and, and talking about those motivation, those drivers, why I set up the business. Yeah. I've always loved food. Yeah. I've always enjoyed my sports, and I hated that that feeling of not being in control of my, not just my diet, but again, the things that come from diet. How I look, how I feel, and the way I perform. So those three things, they, they, tra they kind of transitioned into three words that still sit at the heart of the, of the business, which is convenience, taste, and results. And they were there, like on day dot, but they are there like the last set of polo shirts. Convenience yeah. taste results. Like it, it is, it remains in our DNA. That's really what we believe in. Um, in terms of the values of the business, I've, you know, I I believe every business should really take the time to explore who they are, what they stand for, um, what, you know, very, very precisely what value are they bring into the world, um, what their USP is, and, and, and also just how you package that up into a, into a language that you're happy with. Um, because your point about feeling like a fraud, for, for me, it, it's all about lining up, it's being truthful. Um, you know, you don't on day one say we're the best creative agency in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you shine yeah, the light elsewhere. Exactly. Um, because I think ultimately it's about lining up people's expectations and managing those expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's a, if there's, if there's, you know, I've heard it referred to like a TED talk as an expectation gap. You know, if there is a big gap between what you're, what you're saying, what you're delivering, then you've got an issue. Correct. Um, so how I started to deliver on those on those three things, convenience, taste, results, in terms of sales, uh, I mean, to, without sounding too cheesy and bringing it back to the name, I, I, I realised there, there was a hustler in me. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah. and I realised that on a, out, a simple output level, the, the amount of work I was willing to put in in those early days was, you know, I, I almost look back and I think, you know, bravo, to an extent, I kind of pat myself on the back because there was... There was, I mean, there was an eight-week period where I went to bed every other night, wow. and and the simple thing was I, I refused to I refused not to move forward every day, and there was just times where I was like, well, I haven't done anything today. It's going to make tomorrow easier, so I'm not going to sleep, you know. Unless or, or do I want to be here in, in two weeks' time? That that's so we had a, we had this we had a two-week menu, different menu every day, rotates on a two-week basis, mm -hmm. and I just said, well, the food is going to be the same in two weeks. So I'm going to make sure life is easier in two weeks. Mm -hmm. That could be drafting an email template. It could be outsourcing a piece of work. It could be anything. Five seconds a day to make life easier in two weeks. That was my kind of mentality. Um, in terms of sales, I, I mean, I I tried everything, absolutely everything. So our low hanging fruit and our kind of first target market was um, engaging, mobilizing, incentivizing an intermediate network of personal trainers to reach their clients. Interesting. I, on day one, I thought, you know, I can either go out and try to find individual yeah. clients, or I can say, how can I reach 20, 30, 40 yeah. clients? What you really need is a heightened need for your services based on that intermediary. Correct. So a personal trainer is going to be 60, 80 pounds. They're, they're cl an, an hour. They're, their clients are holding their hands up and saying, I need help. And they're willing to pay for that help. Mm -hmm. And they can also be reached through someone, i.e. the personal trainer. Now, the personal trainer also isn't, as I would say, in the trenches. They're holding their head up and saying, I'm a personal trainer, can yeah. I use my services? Yeah. So they can be reached. So basically, to work out and ask a very, very simple question, which is at the heart of everything I do with sales and everything I've instilled in the team, um, help that business first. How can I help your business? So I, when I think about, and I like my alliteration, fresh fits food, when I think about um, mobilizing and incentivizing those trainers, 
Results, revenue, and reputation. If I can get them better results from helping their clients, if I can introduce a new revenue stream, and if I can build their reputation as an outstanding personal Correct. trainer, then they're going to come to me when their clients need food. So from, from a sales point of view, it's always been, how can I add value and how can I build that person's business? And then it will come back around. You know, I'm a big believer in that. I wouldn't call it karma. I just believe that people... Circle of trust. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a circle of trust, 100%. Yeah. You build a boy, you build a relationship, and obviously it's exactly. going to come back. Um, so yeah, but I, I did try everything. I mean, so when the business started, I was producing the food in my flat in Westmore Park. Yeah. And I was getting, I was going on the tube at Westmore Park and basically heading west, sorry, east into, into the city to, to Liverpool Street. So on day one, you would have a map of London yeah. and there'd be this kind of banana shaped, yeah. shaded area, which was like, if you live outside of here, don't bother, yeah, well. <laughs> because I can't walk to you from the of the city line within five minutes. So that's, that's how the entire business started. I mean, it was ridiculous, yeah. but it was also, it, it, yeah. at least I'd not done the stupid thing of overreaching yeah. myself operationally whilst I had a hundred other things, mm -hmm. sales, marketing, brand, customer care, food safety, da da da, to worry yeah. about. Um, and I mean, so first of all, I reached into my old network and tried to sell anyone that would listen to some food. Um, you know, thank you for those people that kind of put the trust in my cooking, which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially because probably you it wasn't great. Yeah. I think it was a sympathy vote, which, which probably helps a lot of startups. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you were a personal trainer and I came across, you know, certainly on the tube or, in, you know, you got pitched to. Yeah. No way you yeah. pitched. And I, and, I, and I specifically got cards, like, just in case they got off. Because I learned, you know, you pitch once yeah. and you could be halfway through a pitch yeah. and they say, this is my stop. So I had a card which was like, you know, um, Give us your clients macros, yeah. macronutrients, and we'll take care of their food and and and, and pay you for it. Amazing. Or something like Amazing. that. Really punchy. Um, I would run around high park, slowing down, speeding up, catching up and pitching people. Nice. You know, that were running. I call I mean cold calling obviously, but yeah. walking in cold to gyms was Ooh, probably that's interesting. Yeah, that was probably that you know, five minutes research, you find out what makes the gym tip, their business model, who the people are in that gym, and then either the owner or the head trainer. And you walk in and you say, I'm here to see Sarah. And they would be like, have you got an appointment? And you say, no, but I've got some free food. You go, oh, right. Okay. For you as well. I'm Sarah. No. And then you're done. And Sarah's there. And all of a sudden, you've made, you know, you've made some fans. Nice. Um, so that was, that was big. I mean, I, God, literally everything. I mean, I, I'm a big believer. Certainly with a scrappy, which we were, we were bootstrapped. Started, well, didn't start with anyone in the bank. I personally owe £32,400 for a fresh fit food started, despite having earned enough as a lawyer. So I, I used to like to travel and yeah. chase girls around the world. That was where a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, and I'm a big believer, you know, that, that one of the biggest lessons there is you do have to try everything as a startup. Throw absolutely everything at the wall and see what sticks. Because you don't know, you really do not know. Um, it, it is important, yeah. And every so often, in this world, if you start, if you ask 100 businesses, you know, what are you going to do? It'd be like, oh, we're going we're gonna to mm. put adverts on Instagram. It's like, well, what about LinkedIn? Yeah, exactly. Like, what about, what about going completely opposite way and sending out 100 handwritten letters? Yeah. What about picking up the phone? What about email? What about text? Like, some, I know companies are, like, absolutely killing it with SMS. Yeah. Not sexy. No, no. You know, you're not, you're not yeah. picking up kind of, like, you know, bonus points on Instagram amongst your yeah. friend group. But yeah. if you're closing sales, that's what matters. Absolutely. That's very interesting because... Uh, Exhausting all opportunities and, and trying all doors is very interesting because this, uh, you know, in the game of creative, um, we always find we'll go into a group that they would have some sort of a market research already in place as a brand, or they would have perceptions or mm. opinions in the room. And it's so frustrating sometimes that they are not willing to A and B test it because they've left it till the very end. And it's the same problem, I think. Um, we can't run with opinions, we've got to run with real facts and you've got to exhaust mm -hmm. every opportunity that is out there and you're absolutely right. Um, but you're always um, balancing data and gut. That, that's why I found very interesting. Even as you mature as a business, there very are moments where you just have to say, here's all the data plus a number of assumptions that's, that, that are in True. themselves based on experience, but there's always a blob of gut in there as well. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just very interesting you say that. Um, it's very interesting you say that. Um, it's like uh, my partner, she's in uh, genetics and all that, and uh, we, we would, I was talking to her and, and I said, well, how much does it now cost to get your 
sort of genes, whatever, 23,000, 24,000? 23 million. 23, no, so 20, total number oh, of genes. Oh, I see, sorry, yes, yes. So yes, 23,000 yes. that you can map. So 23 and me is a great product, but they, they do about 15 of your chosen ones, 400 quid. I think she said about, it used to cost a billion dollars in 1980 or something like that, and now it costs about five grand if you want to do it properly. But she says the problem is you get so much data, so much data, and the correlations are so difficult right, to understand. Yeah, absolutely. It's called bonkers. So yeah. you have to have... It's not useful. It's not useful. It's not useful. Yeah. And this is very interesting. So how did you come to a point where you started getting all this data from different avenues and, and some of it might be statistically accurate, some mm -hmm. of it might not be a big sample pool. How did you sort of, from your gut, try and make the right decision? Or was it more luck? Or was it more, oh, okay, I'm going to send, you know, I'm going to hire two more salespeople doing this. And that's a big... And yeah. for you. So how as a small business did you come to a point of becoming a sustainable business with sales and marketing? Yeah, um, I, I think you you do just get a, a, with every day that goes past, you understand your client more. I mean, there's a problem here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, that's a completely ongoing battle. Yeah. Like, and I think actually we still, as a business, we still bring a lot of assumptions about our client base that are probably wrong. As in, we know that our, I mean, to give you an example, we built up an Instagram following, and this may be the nature of the platform, we built up an Instagram following where we feel that most of the people following us would never be a client. Interesting. Which is really odd, because our, our average client is 34. We know the average person following us on Instagram is a lot younger. Which is, which, which, which raises the question, like, obviously we need, we, we know we need to that platform, we get a lot of business from that platform. But it makes us think, you know, is our, is our messaging, is our tone of voice, is the platforms we're using etc like the emotive you know mm. the, the, the strings we're pulling do we need to be pitching it to a different audience so we we do know you know we, we now know the average age we we can we can make some very sensible assumptions about household income um we know that most people come to us with um lifestyle goals i.e saving time um uh, an aspirate that aspirational feeling of like wow i've got a personal chef and a nutritionist taking care of me um, we also, we, we can make a, we can make a, a certain level of assumptions about their fitness goals as well. The, the nature of our company, clues in the name, it, you know, most people do sometimes it's just maintenance and feeling happier and healthier, but, but very often, you know, they, they come to us with, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, digging into the nitty gritty detail, um, we have really tried to tighten up understanding where our client comes from. So source of information is something that we try to pull at another two points in the order process. It was a long, it was a long time until we knew the average lifetime value mm -hmm. of the client. That's um, interesting. Yeah, and that takes a long, I mean, clients come back to, you know, to, if they don't order you from, for 10 days, 30 days, 60, 90 days, when do they churn, mm -hmm. you know, the industry yeah, language? Yeah. Um, and if they come back on, they've been treated separately for a year. You know, we've had some clients come back to us two years later. Um, so when do they, when they officially are not a client, a client, um, and the churn rate is a, is a funny figure as well. Well, the way we take, even just the way we take money as a business is, is, is interesting. So you can order anywhere from five to a hundred days of food and you're completely, it's completely flexible. So you could have, you could just have food on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for however many weeks. Makes sense. You could have food seven days a week. You can also pause it if you go on holiday. So super flexible, very busy Londoner focused. Um, so we we become more data hungry and more savvy. We we definitely got those that, you know on a, on a granular level we're capturing information at key moments. Um, I think also the, the just the nature of being a more mature business, your data set, unless you're unless you're dropping the ball and you're not collecting it, your data set becomes better with every day that goes past. Every single client that orders, it just gives us the confidence to rely on that data more and more and more. You know, now we know we're not, we're not thinking we've got 100 clients and the average 34. We've got seven years, tens of thousands of clients and the average age is 34. So we know that data, that data, that data is, yeah, it becomes richer, it becomes more reliable. Um, in terms of marketing, um, we're, I, I think what's helped us immensely is that we are, we didn't start life as a digital business. We really didn't. Like, it's no, it's, it's in, a bit in, in the company, it's no secret that I'm technically illiterate. <laughs> to the extent where it's probably between 
between myself and the current CEO, it's probably a joke that I have the ability to like break technology. <laughs> I have the, I have like an anti Midas <laughs> touch <laughs> with, with, with technology. Um, and so we didn't start life as a tech business, but what that forced us to do, and, it, and, and, it, and it's a big belief I had, I went out and I spoke to our first 100 clients, every single one of them. And after maybe a couple of years, I just thought, I'm becoming a bit detached. Mm -hmm. So I said, right, I emailed probably about 160 clients, mm -hmm. went for coffee with 50 of them. 50 paying clients, some on service, some off the, off the service, and I just said, look, what do you think? Did you like this? Why, you know, why didn't you order? Would you reorder? What would make you reorder? You know, have you recommended to your partner? Why not? You know, have you recommended to a colleague? What would make you recommend to a colleague? Mm -hmm. um, so just taking the time for those for that human connection. As we mature, obviously, we have become more more data savvy. Um, but I don't think we've lost that grassroots engagement. We do a lot. You know, we we feed a lot of events. We support gym openings. Um, we, we really like to get to know what makes a business tick and then ask a simple question, how can we support that at the right moment? So if it's, if a gym, if the core of a gym's model is running two 12 week transformations a year, we love that. Because mm -hmm. I can say, well, I, now, now I understand your business. So I understand you send a Facebook ad out, mm -hmm. out, out here, you have someone that comes along for a free talk and consultation, mm -hmm. body scan, then they start on this day and they end on that day. Fantastic, and along the way they have Every three weeks, they have a they have a check in, because now we can produce some marketing material which says not generally hi here's our business. We can say thanks for coming along to the to, to the info night. Yeah. We are fresh fix food. We partner with this gym, and this is a special offer. We can make it time sensitive. Go back to sales one on one. Time scarcity. Clock's ticking. Do you want fifteen percent off, or do you want ten percent off? Because you've got until midnight. But then those check in moments. That's either. When someone's doing really well, they don't need our service, congratulations, or they're not progressing as they want to, and we can just drop in a, well, why not? But why not have a phone call, free phone call with one of our nutritionists? You know, completely no obligation, mm -hmm. see if we can help you. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about our model is it's, it's not just knowledge that we're, that we're selling. It's not the knowledge of how to cook your food. You know, that was, I, 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 when I was a lawyer, I went out and I spoke to many, many experts about how to, to help my diet. And, and, I had it written on a piece of paper. I was getting home at one o'clock. It was relevant. I needed someone to do the important yeah. bit, which was planning, cooking, shopping, buying, and you know, we 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 save our clients an hour a week from a survey of our entire client base. That's that's on average. Uh, sorry, an hour a day. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An, an hour a day save, which which is huge. It's and that's huge. Yeah, it's giving you half a working day back yeah. a week and something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's it's, it's big. It's fantastic. In terms of, you mentioned about having a new CEO now, so you've taken a back seat. So in terms of the journey of the brand, are you, um, do you still own a part of the company? Yeah. Is it okay. Yeah. Uh, all, all of it. And do you, do you decide, have you decided at some point, might be not something you want to talk about, that you want to make an exit, you want to sell it to a bigger brand? Is that intent, intended? Yeah, that's, that's not a secret. I, I think when you start a, when you start a business, I hadn't even thought about, I mean, I didn't even think about investment for yeah. the first, you know, whatever. And then I, then I didn't think about selling for the next. Um, and I think, I, I think it's a good mindset to have, that Lincoln approach. It's also a bad mind. Uh, it's a good from a mindset, work ethic point of view, but it's probably, I wish I had been a little more open. Because if you can shape your business decisions around investors straight from the beginning. Even if you have no intention of taking investment or you have no intention of selling the business, it's such a high standard that if that's how you're I running your business, you, you know, great, you know, great litmus test for whether you're whether you're making sensible decisions. Mm -hmm. So I, I wish I'd kind of like balance the, the two the mindset of like, I'm not saying this, I'm just gonna mm -hmm. build it, but also the kind of okay, well maybe I should be investing in this. Um, but no, look. I, I, first of all, everyone everyone has a price, you know, I, and and I think that's not a you know you, yeah. you said you said earlier that sales isn't this dirty business, and yeah. I think that um, building a business and, and so you know I'm, I'm you know, the considerations I have now, I, you know, I have, I have a partner, you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have kids, yeah. you know, we're gonna set up a life, so the financial security and the options that we bring would be would be nice. Yeah. Um, It'll be a sad day mm. when it does. It really will be. You know, um, I've put a lot of myself into the business. Um, I, I've I've handed the business over to someone who I trust. You know, you know implicitly, 
And he's, he's I, I mean, I owe so much to his tenacity, to his leadership skills. He's just an incredible human. Like he's got an incredible work ethic and it's not an easy business to, business okay. to run. Um, but no, I mean, I, I don't, we're not ready to sell yet. You know, we, we, the, with our last round of investment, you know, an, an, an individual led the round and is very institutional minded in his investment. And he's, he's made many, many investments and taken businesses up through many stages of investment from seed to IPO. Um, so we are starting to have, you know, starting to have big conversations about either a very big noisy round, um, but a round that could basically bring on someone which can then kick through and mm -hmm. purchase it if we do what we what, what they need us to do. Um, so can't go into it too much. No, but we're, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're speaking to some... Yeah, there was conversations. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, because, you know, um, it, I can relate to that in, in some way. You just started something because you purely were passionate about being entrepreneurial, finding your Absolutely. voice, you know, just doing something for yourself. And I can relate to that where, we, you know, we started being creative business just for the fun of it and then now we realise actually we can add more value being either more tech savvy mm. or sort of ad tech platforms, whatever they are. But it's it's very interesting when you talk about uh, making sure you have that mindset that are we investor friendly from the very beginning and are we planning to ever exit this? Um, will everyone want to buy this? You know, anyone would like to buy it. And I think that's a great way to kind of, the analogy is the Airbnb. Are you going to, you know, rent your room out on Airbnb? If so, it needs to be pretty enough to be able yeah, to yeah, rent yeah. it. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, it's very interesting. But tell me more about your drive as a serial entrepreneur moving into your new venture plant and mm. you're also trying to do something in uh, sort of the food tech side yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's keeping you ticking? Um, is is that the search for the purpose, or you just you just um, don't stop? Yeah, I think partly I've got a busy mind, mm. um, and, and I actually realised uh, there was points of fresh fitness food where I was I was having this entrepreneurial itch, you know, that I uh, that I needed to scratch. Um, so it's partly that. Um, it's partly a, a real desire to, to learn. And I actually think that the points at which I felt least motivated with Fresh Fitness Food is where I felt that I was not doing something new and exciting. And actually, I kind of realised I'm possibly, well, not possibly, I'm more of an entrepreneur than an operator. Interesting. You know? um, and I think that as much as I do love process and structure, I love to create. Mm -hmm. and I, I love to innovate and I love to, I love to try stuff. I'm not. I'm, I'm certainly not scared of failure. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, you know, it just doesn't bother me. I, th yeah. I think it's a necessary step on the way. Um, so, but there are some. I mentioned earlier my, my long term goals. So I, I've got I've got two goals in in, in in other than kind of the, my personal life. I've got two kind of business goals. Um, one is really simple and easy to to, to describe. I know what it looks like. It's a Cornish whiskey distillery. So that's really easy. That's my kind of 20 year, 30 yeah. year retirement plan. Right. Done. Yeah. Easy. Box tick. Uh, I'll buy a bunch of from you. I just <laughs> probably need about 50 million. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Chuck up a million and you can have yeah. the first bottle. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. The second bit, the one that's a little more, well, it's not really short term, it's medium term, but let, let's say it's my 10 year goal. If, if, the, if the whiskey distillery is my 20 year goal, um, I realise how passionate I am about helping other businesses. Mm. Um, and in order to do that in a way that I feel is going to have a huge impact, I've got a very particular idea of what I want that to look and feel like. So I want it to be an incubator accelerator mm -hmm. unit that sits in a very particular stage of the journey. So I, when I, you know, as I started to understand more about fundraising, I realised that go back, go back 15 years, friends and family, credit cards, anything down the back of a couch, and then you have like institutional, Correct. like angels and early stage VCs. And some things have happened here. Like people are more receptive, like the government has stepped mm. in with SEIS and EIS relief to kind of incentivize investment in yep. small businesses. Crowdfunding has had a huge impact. You know, crowdfunding and, and, and Kickstarter campaigns really occupy a lovely space there. But I don't think there is anything, certainly not in this country, I think it's a bit different in the States, That's a bit true. further yeah. online. Yeah. There's nothing in this country for me which basically helps very early stage mm. businesses find out in a very quick um, and a very structured and tried and tested way whether they are destined to fail or succeed mm -hmm. and in some ways 
the problem, the bigger problem is not failure. The bigger problem is almost being successful. Correct. You know, running running a business where you pay yourself no 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 no, no being yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to pay yeah, yourself yeah, twenty yeah. grand. Yeah. But if you're if you're setting your sights on a huge impact mm -hmm. and you're just fighting for twenty years. Barely paying yourself, barely paying yeah. your staff, sometimes missing payroll, delivering a poor quality service, etc. Yeah. That's not ideal. Fail in six months and move on to something else because something else is your calling. Exactly. Um, so the way that, that that looks is to physically house, and I, I got some rough numbers, but let's say I'm going to physically house 20 startups. Okay. Um, ground floor, half of it hot desking, mm -hmm. office space. Um, 20 startups that are that have come in and rather than talking about rent like when we yeah. work, pushed a business plan over and said this is what we want to build and at that stage the conversation would be we love you we yeah. love your team we love the idea but you need two hundred thousand pounds yeah everything's great about you but your your tech shit so we're going to speak you can speak to adam who's, yeah. who's, who's our kind of like outsourced cto mm -hmm. and we insist on dropping someone on your board that's going to be a cfo because you haven't got anyone in that in that filling that you know role um and we're also going to house you here and i want that ecosystem to be really collaborative i want to push every startup to give back to the community so maybe if they are paying rent then their rent can be reduced they can yeah. almost build you know, they can you could give a lecture on on, on producing yeah, creative yeah, short films yeah, or something yeah, like that yeah. and, and if you do that you know two things, your rent's coming down, but also yeah. you're going to get a lecture from me on fundraising yeah. and from, from John on yeah. digital advertising. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but I want that single space to provide everything you need as a startup. An infinity wall for photography, a podcasting room, um, a all singing, all dancing, YouTube style, 200 grand camera to look into, mm -hmm. and do, you know, whatever, everything. I want there to be meeting rooms, lecture halls, library, real focus on basically how can a physical space for social interaction in, in an entrepreneurial environment. So that's the ground floor uh, and, and, and also I should add that my, my kind of, my goal around business and, and, and charity has become really focused. I, I, I love and I, the idea really came originally from Tom's, you know, the one the shoes, one for one. Yeah. Um, and, and that's certainly what's kind of hitting a couple of the other businesses I'm starting now. But with the, the incubator accelerator unit, my, my goal is to be profitable enough that for every business we're looking after where there's a commercial arrangement, mm -hmm. we're taking equity in exchange for X, Y, and Z. I want to be housing another business but doing it for free as well. So whether that's because that business just doesn't have the resources, yeah. um, they're just too early, uh, or they're from a, you know, a particular kind of background where they, have, they really do not have access to the type of channels that a lot of, a lot of people are fortunate enough to have right. because of where they went to university or who their dad is then I'd love to kind of have a one-for-one -one model there as well. Uh, and upstairs, kind of, is almost where the, the grey hairs are. So we would have a, you know, half, half the building would be the people that are running that business. And in the other side of the building, um, basically is the talent. So I want to build up a network of incredible, incredible people, incredible individuals that can basically be dropped into these businesses and add just an incredible amount of value. And, and the phrase there is people that can move a business forward months in an hour. CTO, CMO, graphic designers, virtual personal assistants, everything a business could possibly need to go from A to B. And the model is going to be a scaled down version of a typical VC model where we look to make 10 investments and, and you know, one of them, fingers crossed, goes to the nose. Yeah. Um, but also, I very much understood that in the investment landscape, it's very much about who you know above and below you. So some businesses know they only invest between five and 10 million. And even if the next Uber walks in, they think this is the next Uber. If they're looking for 20 million, they're like, it's, it's not our deal size. But speak to this, this person, you know, this VC fund, and, and the same happens back and forth. So I'm trying to build up my network above me with early stage VCs and angels, so I can push their work when, when it's ready. Um, you know, my, my ticket size I sense is gonna be between 50 and 500,000, and then I'll let the bigger boys go and fly. At the same time, I'm trying to do what I don't think any VC fund does very well, which is um, speak to entrepreneurs in the way they need to be spoken to and in spaces they want to be spoken to. So I'm kind of building up my brand around the idea of a startup architect, um, which 
I didn't know what to call myself. I didn't want to be a business coach because it kind of like yeah, I think different. about someone leaning on a Lamborghini on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just couldn't look at myself in the mirror if I kind of felt that as the way my life was going. Um, but a couple of clients turned around to me independently of each other and said, "Oh, you're like a startup architect." So I, I'm kind of building up that, mm. that that notion of basically helping them, you know the foundations and the structure, and then letting someone else go and operate the business and then and run with it. Um, and I asked myself a simple question, like, how, how do I, you know, with the, with the whiskey distillery and with the incubator accelerator unit, how do I, how do I get there and then reverse out of it? And with the latter, I, I realised that um, I need to massively upskill myself and, and understand a lot more about that investment landscape. I need to expand my network into, you know, not just the people I've been exposed to through fresh fitness food, you know, the the, the content producers, the marketers, etc., yeah. but the, the world of, of serious finance, the less sexy world yeah, of kind of yeah. like, you know, SME lawyers and, and IP specialists, etc. So really expand network, the people that I can then utilize later on. Um, I also need to, as with any brand building process, I need to build up my credibility, you know, to elicit trust. Uh, to build rapport with an audience in a digital space takes a Correct. lot. And so that's, I'm spending a, a good amount of time on that. For the first time, I've never really, you know, I only started to do it last September, but I've never really focused on my personal brand. Fresh okay. Fitness Food was all about, this is the corporate brand. I didn't want to confuse matters by putting my name above the door. Mm. You know? it's, it's very interesting because um, you are in true sense of the word, um, sort of a, a brave hustler in the sense that you identified yourself with obviously grind, you identified yourself, you like the idea of toying with and building new things, um, and you're not scared of failure. Um, but in your own definition, how do you define a brave hustler? Well, I think well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think I think the hustle comes from the hard work. Um, and, and I'm a big believer in that. I, I you know one of the messages I do push out is yes, it's great to work smarter and not harder. But if there's someone else in the room doing both, you'll come second. If there's someone else working smarter right. and harder, then, then you'll lose. And so I'm a big believer in, in, in hard work. And I, I love the kind of the Elon Musk language of like, well look, if, if I do a 100 hour week and you're doing a 50 hour week, we wake up at the end of the year and you know, I work yeah, for yeah. hours to be over, of course. Um, so the, I think that's where the hustler comes from. I also think the hustler comes back to that willingness to just try everything. You know, and I guess that's where the cross. I guess that's the connection to brave. You know, to be a to be a brave hustler for me, it it, it involves embracing the possibility of failure, because you're just going to have to try absolutely everything. Mm. And you may, at the back of your mind, there may be this very very strong, loud, convincing voice that says, "This is going to fail." One hundred percent, mate. This is going to fail. And yet you hold your head high. You walk into the room and you. Kill it, you nail it, you give it hundred percent. And I've I've hundred percent been there many, many, many times. I've walked in and I thought this is gonna be fantastic, there's gonna be a room full of fifty people, I'm gonna pitch it, I'm gonna pick up ten clients and the world's gonna be rosy. You walk in and there's two people and they're not really even interested. But your role in that moment is to have the same energy and the same approach, the same mindset, and to wow those people, to just wow the shit out of them yeah. so they can go and spread the word. You know. Jared, pleasure meeting you. Thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Really enjoyed the show. Yeah. Thank you.